that's uh, with uh, Ray Sandelli. Uh, who is he? Uh, some of you know already. Uh, he is, as of tomorrow, the managing, uh, he assumes a position as the managing partner of CRE Consultants uh, after having closed out a little over a quarter of a century as, uh, as a, a leader in uh, CBRE uh, real estate. He started out uh, uh, in Seattle not that long ago uh, as a, as a uh, leasing specialist and, uh, and then he went uh, to, uh, to uh, Cincinnati in 1987, took over an office there, found his way down to Tampa with CBRE in uh, 1987, was there uh, since, or rather 95, and was, uh, has been there ever since. Uh, he was, uh, uh, when he, when he uh, clo closed out his career with them, he had statewide oversight uh, for lenders and servicers representation for all kinds of properties in their re recovery and re uh, restructure, I have practiced a restructuring service program uh, a, cha a challenging uh, enterprise that uh, sounds interesting in itself. Uh, he was the uh, uh, he was uh, the, the senior managing director of the Florida region with CBRE. Uh, in 2000, he received the J. Frank Mahoney Award for Excellence, which is CBRE's highest award for management uh, performance. In 2005, his region, the Florida region, uh, got the president's uh, award as CBRE's top performing large market area. So as you learn from him and just uh, all his comments, he, he is uh, he's part of uh, he's highly regarded and well-connected in a worldwide CBRE network. Um, he's, uh, um, he has uh, been extremely active at the same time, we've always been aware of this, in, in civic affairs. And uh, he's past president of the Real Estate Investment Council, I think it's the Tampa region. Uh, he is uh, uh, foundation chair and past president of the Tampa Downtown Rotary Club uh, and uh, past chair of the Tampa Downtown Partnership and uh, member of our board and served as chair as our advisory board uh, a few years ago. And he's also a volunteer in a number of important civic organizations. So we're, uh, as I told him earlier today, uh, we. Uh, we, we're, we're delighted to see him here now. He's in the midst of a tremendous amount of the events going on in his life and career. And, uh, but you know how it is. Uh, find somebody who's too busy and they're the one who can always get there. And uh, so here he is again with us and we're delighted to have him with you, uh, with, with us. Um, he grew up in New Jersey, went to college in New Jersey, uh, Monmouth College, uh, where he did a BSBA. And then he had a few years in the Navy which I hope he'll uh, allude to and fill you in on if you don't already know. So welcome to Thank you, Dr. our great friends. Thank you. I always feel like I should quit while I'm ahead there, you know, when people read all that kind of stuff. Um, well, Dr. Archer and Dr. Ling and the staff and everybody and Tim, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I uh, was always I was surprised when they called me up and asked me if I would participate in this because I think that, you know, so highly of the speakers that have, that have come before me. Um, made me think back though when, I, when Dr. Archer called me, he said, uh, I said, well, what would the students need? What would they like to hear about? And he said, Ray, he said, I, you know, I, I think they always like kind of the real time things. What's going on outside the classroom? And so uh, I thought about a, a, two things. One was a few years ago, I was asked by the Tampa uh, Bar, you know, to give them an annual update, which I did. And uh, when I called them up to ask them what they wanted me to talk about, they said, well, talk about the economy. What's going on in the economy? And I said, well, I'm not an economist, you know. But Ben Bernanke was speaking in Jackson Hole a few weeks later. I thought, perfect. I'll just listen to what Bernanke says. I'll get a few sound bites from that. And that's my presentation. So Bernanke's there, and, and they ask him about the economy's going. He says, it's unusually uncertain. What the hell am I supposed to do with that? You know, <laughs> unusually uncertain. What kind of lead-in is that? Um, and then the second thing, you know, when, when Dr. Archer called me about this was a book that was written by a guy named Mark McCormick years ago, and it was called What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School. And um, I remember reading it and I thought, that's pretty insightful because, you know, the opportunity that you have here, you know, is, is really unprecedented. You have this great university with a dedicated team, you know, to give you everything you need to know in the classroom. And some of you have been out, you know, work before and you're coming back and you're committing now to further your education. Um, but what I did find is that there are, you know, always those questions about kind of where am I, you know, today? 
you know, how do I get through this? You know, is, am I breaking new ground or is, you know, somebody been down this road before? And so that's really kind of how I formulated this, you know. And so what I want to do today is that, you know, this is not a traditional academic session. So, you know, I want you to sit back and relax. I just want you to think, you know. Um, it's not technical in any sense, all right? So there's no right or wrong answers. So we, there's no test at the end. You know, what it is, it's a sharing of lessons simply by doing. It's my path through life and some of the lessons that I've learned, you know, along the way, which I'll share with you today, and what some of my friends have shared also. It's, um, it's about business, but it's also about life. Um, and it's to be shared as a foundation to be built upon. You know, it was, uh, it was interesting that, uh, let me see if I can pull these out here if I got them. I was, uh, and I think when you, when you can combine your business life and your professional life, that's the sweet spot that we're all trying to, to figure out. That's the, when you, that's the fabric of who you are. And so I, I was at Duke University last week for a conference, and uh, I'm on Southwest Airlines, which I think is a great airline. And I tore a few pages out of their book, you know. One, one was from, uh, you know, the, the singer Alanis Morissette, who I like her music. And she says she was talking about how she used to compartmentalize things. This was my work life, and this was my family life. And she said, and I used to have a personal life and a work life. These little things were in little boxes. Uh, not a moment too soon, my life has finally become integrated, and it has been a huge blessing. And I think that's what I'm trying to do in part, is to say if you can bring your personal life and your business life together, that's the sweet spot that makes it all work. Okay, so where do we start? We start when we come into the world. Yes, that's me. This looks like the first Photoshop from The Sopranos, I think. <laughs> you know, <laughs> actually in New Jersey. You know, when you, when you come into the world, parents have great aspirations for their kids. I'm the father of three. You think about, you know, what you want these kids to be. How can I give them more opportunities than I had? You know, what can I expand their horizons? And so um, that's part of it. And then, you know, everybody starts asking you, what are you going to be when you grow up? You know, I don't know. I'm going to go out and play right now. You know, I'm not, I don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up. But this is all noise that's starting to affect who you are in, in that direction in life. You know, your friends, they start heading down different paths. What are they doing? Why are they doing that? You know, what's, what's so interesting about that? And so, again, you're, you're getting this input into who you are. Society places certain values on certain pursuits. You know, my son, my daughter, is going to be a doctor, is going to be a lawyer. Maybe that's not a good example. You know, and, and uh, so, you know, people put that. So you have that noise. And what we're really trying to figure out is what drives us. What are we interested in? And how much do we believe in ourselves? to make that decision. Um, and how do we do that at the same time trying to satisfy all this extrasensory stuff that's kind of overloading us, okay? Oh. Hi, Mom, I'm giving a speech right now, thanks. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Turn that off. Should have done that. So what did I learn from that? First thing, clarity will come by pursuing your interests. You know, and we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a little bit as we go along here. You only get clarity by pursuing what you feel inside here, what's passionate about what you're doing. And I also want you to think his, uh, holistically, and that's place, people, and pursuits. Who do you want to be around? Where do you want to, you know, operate from? You know, and what are you trying to pursue? That's all part of that holistic side. For me, it was actually pretty easy. Um, I was all about flight. And so my buddy over here, Tofu, will understand this. And that's his call sign, if you don't, you don't know that by now, Calv's call sign. Um, I was interested, I used to lay in the grass as a kid. I would look up and see these contrails across the sky and see that little piece of silver up there and go, man, people are flying around up there. How, is that, how, did that, how does that work? You know, how do you get above all this? So that, that was it. I built models. I worked at airports. I watched TV shows. I was consumed with that passion. That's what I wanted to do. And so what it did is it gave me a vision of what I wanted my life to look like. And I'm going to refer to that a few times today. Do you have a vision of what you want out there, you know, for your life to look like? Now, the road between where you are today and going to that vision is going to take a lot of different times. Some things will confirm what you're going to. Some things will challenge you, and that's okay. Um, so what did, I, what did I learn from that? Think without limits. Um, we talked about this outside with a, with a small group. You know, sometimes... You grow up in a family, and I, ha I came from an Italian family in New Jersey. We had three generations that lived in one town. That was their whole world. There's nothing wrong with that. 
but they grew up there, they went to school there, they died there, you know, and I was the first one to go rogue, you know, and go out and do something different. Second thing is there's a difference between a goal and a dream. You can waste a lot of time, you know, on dreaming. You know, do you really have a goal that you're willing to commit to and that you're willing to, you know, put the time and effort into? So that was the first part. Oh, back up here. Next part is, you know, then you were off on our education. I went through a Catholic grammar school. That's Sister Rose and Sister Damien. I still remember this, their names from today. That's the impact that they had on my life at that early part. But I went to a private elementary school. You know, it was very disciplined, which was, not, which was easy for me because I grew up in an Italian family. There was right and wrong and little wrong room for interpretation. Um, it was faith-based and there was a balance. So it was a, it was a very good place to start. And then I went to a public high school. And I struggled, you know, with that transition. Why did I struggle? Because it was a much broader base of student and, and faculty. Much, you know, much more diverse, you know, much more open, much more collaborative in a lot of different ways. And I, but I struggled with that because I was in this, this, I came out of this elementary school type situation. But what I discovered were certain strengths in myself and certain strengths within the people that I was interfacing with and the benefits of relationships, which I'll, I'll talk on, you know, a little bit later also. So then I go off to a private college, and rea in reality, it was a mistake. I walked up, went to a private college because some of the family members that uh, before me had gone there, and they said, hey, you got to go to Monmouth and everything. It's a great school. The other thing was four blocks from the beach, and I was into surfing, so I thought that was a good idea, so I could justify it that way. So I go off to college, and, and again, I struggle, you know, the first part of my, my, uh, my time there, because now I'm back in a, a much smaller environment and the other thing is I'm trying to figure out how I go from you know my passion which is aviation what this all means to me now a parent you know I'm the first one to go to college okay so my parents are very proud of me they send me off and um, I f my mom passed away uh, earlier this year and I was going through some old letters and I found this letter that I wrote while I was in college to my mom and my parents it said I really can't see how this four-year education um, will benefit me in, in my vocation. Yes, it's nice to say you're a college graduate if you can use it. Um, I'm glad I have finished two years of school. I have given me an opportunity to learn more about myself and make some great friends. I wish you could understand how much I simply want to fly. Now, I, I read this as a parent and say to myself, well, how would I react if I got this letter from my kids? You know, I was their pride and joy. I was off to do this thing, but it didn't marry up with what I was doing. At the same time, uh, I, I, one of the guys in the dorm, I go down to his room, and he has this wall full of pictures of jets. And it was like, what is this all about? He said, hey, he said, I'm, gonna, I'm in a NAVROC program. I go away two summers. I get a commission when I graduate. And he said, why don't you come down to Lake Earth Naval Air Station and meet the guys? So I go down there, and they put me in an airplane. I'm sold. But what they tell me is, you need a four-year degree to do this. And so I'm glad I listened to my dad. You know, I, and now I had a goal, though, just to get through school for the following two years and, and go off. So lessons there, near term, as I said, can be confusing and it can be uncertain. But you always revert back to that vision you have. I was at Duke last week and we were sitting outside on the tee box of one of the greens and got ready for going to a dinner. And we're looking out there and I see the, the flag. And I thought, now, that's, that's the goal, to get to that hole and put the ball in the cup. With my game, it's going to take a lot of different variations in order to get there. So the same thing is, near term can be confusing, but if you have that goal out front, what you want your life to look like, it'll work. Second thing is, is be open and introspective. You know, uh, be open to, to what's going on around you. Don't rely on yourself, but you have to trust yourself. Uh, you get pulled in a lot of different directions because of all this noise. Trust yourself, because there are going to be situations later on in life where those dark moments or those moments you just have to fall back on, and you have to believe in yourself. Okay. So I finish school, and uh, off I go to the United States Navy, much like Cal over here. Um, it was a unique starting point for me. It was a unique starting point because, as I mentioned to you before, I had trouble in the transition points. I had trouble with trying to figure out why it was important to me. I had trouble in the transition because I didn't know where it was taking me. In Pensacola, you go down there, and in 30 minutes, I had no hair, a green flight suit, and I was standing in front of a drill instructor. There was no time to uh, figure out what the transition was going to be like. It was happening around me. The other thing that I learned was that fear of failure was a motivation. Before, I was always relying on myself, get a good grade, do this, that type of thing. Now I was part of a group. 
And what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to be the weak link in that chain. And so I did not want to be the weak link. I didn't want to be the failure. So fear motivated me to be better, to not let the group down. Now, I go down there and I'm pretty full of myself now. I am finally pursuing my dream. I'm in Pensacola. Flags are flying. We're on graduation day. I finished first in my class. I'm the regimental commander. I lead the whole regiment on the field. <clears throat> my family's there and I'm pretty full of myself. I am Tom Cruise before Tom Cruise was a script, okay? <laughs> I mean, I was God's gift to aviation. Hadn't flown an airplane yet, but that's where I was. I mean, I was fulfilling my dream. So we, we get commissioned and my, tell my parents, go over to that building over there. I have to go over here. I have to go back to the bachelor officer quarters and put on my new khaki uniforms with my little gold bars because we had these little cheap white chokers on. So I run back and put this uniform on, got my little gold bars on, I'm somebody. Got my aviation sunglasses on, I come walking across the prey field that I just graduated on an hour later, an er, er, hour earlier. And a petty officer first class is walking towards me. And I go, he better salute me because I'm Ensign Ray Sandelli, United States Navy, God's gift aviation. He brings his hand up, I bring my hand up, I'm going to give him a salute, he'll never forget. Boom, my sunglasses go flying off, you know. <laughs> well, they don't teach you that in OCS. He walks by me, he never broke stride, he picked up the glasses, he handed them back to me, hit me on the side, he goes, it's okay, sir, it'll come in time, you know, <laughs> and he kept walking. And if there was a hole, I would, have, I would have crawled in the hole. But if you think that somebody owes you something because you have a degree on the wall, because you have a gold bar in your collar, let me tell you something, it can go that, that fast. And the only person that tells that story probably more than me is that petty officer first class. And I hope he does because, you know, he knew exactly who he was up against. I didn't. And I got put in my place pretty quickly. But it's a lesson that stayed with me. That's a long time ago. So what I learned in the military uh, was a combination of technical skills and human dynamics. The world that Caleb and I came out of, and maybe some of you, you know, is, a, is where technical abilities and technical, you know, learning uh, is very important. But there's the human dynamics of working together with the team, you know. And I think you're finding that here. You know, what's it like? We had some of that discussion outside. What's it like? to be focused on your study, but dealing with the dynamics of everybody in this room. And it's a great training ground for, you know, for the next step. Second thing is, um, the true test begins when responsibility shifts from yourself to others. For so long, you worry about you. You worry about what you're, how you're being measured. You're worrying about um, how the check marks that you're filling in. But when that responsibility shifts to others, you know, that's really the key. And so that was the, the learning part of there. Okay, so now here I am. I uh, had this dream. I went through school, finished school like my dad told me. Um, went into the Navy, I'm pursuing this dream. And then, you know, the landscape starts to change a little bit. And it maybe it changed for some of you. Maybe you were walking down a certain road and, and whatever. What I found was that I started to realize, and maybe Cal, you know, maybe the same thing here, is that I realized the sacrifice that it took, not just for me, but for a family, and I was still single at the time. We flew in from a, a seven-month deployment. We fly in, we park all the jets, we get out, we're walking up and the families are there and they let the families run down to greet everybody. This little kid runs up and he grabs me by the leg. He goes, you my dad? I go, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Only gone seven months. Um, you know, but you know, I realized what's, that the sacrifice was, not only for the guys that I was on the ship with, but the sacrifice of the families there. And I had to ask myself, does that fit into the vision that I want down the road. And I realized right there that this is not what I want to do long term. Second thing is, is that there's a progression away from core interest. All I wanted to do was be in the cockpit of an airplane. That's where I was happy. That's what I was all about. Well, as you move on, you know, and stuff like this, you get out of the airplane. You're going to be a boat driver or you're going to have a tour in Washington, D.C. But that's the reality of the progression through there and you have to deal with that. So you either accept it and say that's part of the career and I, I see the bigger picture or I just want to be inside the airplane. And so then of course there's the realities of the politics and the operations that you see, whether it's a business organization, whether it's in a you know, educational situation, whether it was in the military. So what are some of the lessons I learned from that part of my life? That friends seldom know more than you do. The easy thing to do is to turn to the people next to you and say, what do you think about this? I've got news for you. You know, maybe great people. They don't know any more than you do. And so, you know, it's, you're sharing on the same basis of information. And uh, it's good, great to have friends, it's good to collaborate. But the reality is when you're trying to develop that vision, you're kind of looking ahead. And I think that's really the strength of this program here. 
Um, I've been on a lot of boards and a lot of different things. The board for this school is unprecedented. Not only in who they are and what they've done, but their willingness to make time to say, hey, if you have a need, I'm there for you. you know? And that's going to be important in a lot of different ways. Second thing is questioning you know, uh, you know, it reinforces and challenges you. It's good to question, am I doing the right thing? Am I really committed to this? You know, or should I be looking at something else? And I think it will even reinforce you and strengthens your position, or it will say maybe I really should be looking at something else. The secret there is to find a mentor. Um, I had two in my life besides my dad. Um, one was um, Captain Bill Barrow, who's in Pensacola. He was a naval aviator, and he um, was a test pilot. And then he transitioned into business, one of the most entrepreneurial people I've ever met. And the other guy is a gentleman named Skip Beebe, who I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later. They have been instrumental in my life, personally and professionally. And the third thing is, decisions will be important to you uh, and to employers. Think about, if you're going to make a change, how well did I vet this? How am I going to frame it? How am I going to explain it? Had a young man come in my office one day. I looked at his resume. He had seven jobs in 10 years. Sitting on the couch. I said, Danny, what do you really want to do? He said, uh, he was almost relieved that somebody asked him what he wanted to do. He sat back and he says, I want to ski in Europe. I said, good. I said, what you need to do is you need to scrape together a couple thousand bucks and you need to go ski in Europe. Because until you do that, you have no end game here other than that. And so you're just bouncing between these jobs. Oh, my mother knew somebody, a friend of mine knew somebody. You know, you, I'm not going to take, as an employer, I'm not going to take a bet on that strategy. Now, somebody comes in and says, hey, you know, I... Um, I started out here, here's why I made that decision, here's what happened within the company, here's how things changed, and here's why I'm exploring an you know, opportunity. It's a whole different game, it's a conversation. So again, think, when, those, when you make those decisions, it's not just affecting you, somebody is basing their commitment to you in the future on, on what's going on. Okay, so I decide to get out of the Navy. All right, I realize that this is not what I want long term, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out. I'm going to tell you, if you have the opportunity, and I did it earlier in my life, which I'll talk about in a minute, and I'm doing it, I did it really right now over the last seven months. If you have the ability to take a break, I'm telling you, take it. Take some time off and kind of cleanse the brain. You know, and you can't do it on a long weekend. You can't do it on a two-week vacation. Take some time. Um, what it does, it allows you have lack of distraction. I retired from CB in February. We have a beach house up in New Jersey. Fortunately, we still have it after the, after the hurricane. But... Um, in the past, when I would go on vacation for a couple weeks, I had budget time. They were flying stuff up to me. I had people calling me for a variety of different reasons or calls. I'd walk down the beach this past summer. I'd go, man, what day is this? Wednesday? Tuesday? I went to church Sunday. That's a couple days. You know, whatever. I had a different clarity of thought. It allowed me to look at different opportunities in a, in a very different way. The other thing is, is that I found uh, in that period of my life when I took some time off after I got out that um, I found people versus a career. Um, I was flying, I got called by the Naval Aviation Museum Foundation. They said, Ray, I hear that you're, you just got out, you're hanging around Pensacola, how about flying our airplane for us for the summer? I said, sure, I'll do that. So this is a picture in that airplane there. His hair's a little bit longer, I, was getting, I thought it was pretty cool. Anyhow, I fly a trip out to Bremerton, Washington, and um, I'm putting the airplane away, and this guy comes walking down the ramp, and he says, uh, hey, that's a nice airplane, go take a look at it. He comes down, and he says, what are you going to do? I said, I'm not sure yet. I said, uh, probably something in aviation is what I've been involved in for the last, you know, seven or eight years. And he said, uh, did you ever think about real estate? And I said, well, you know, selling houses, nights and weekends, I said, I just don't know if that fits in that vision that I had. My dad used to be home at 5, 30, 6 o'clock every night. We had dinner together. I wanted that. That's what meant important to me. That was my fabric of who I, is, I was. So he said, well, I'm in commercial real estate. Uh, what's that? You know, he said, well, we sell office buildings and lease buildings and shopping centers. I said, okay. So I go over to the CB office, the Cold Banker office then at the time in Seattle. And what I found is, and in, in Calvin and I were talking about this, I found people that were very similar to the people that I flew with. They worked hard. They played hard. There was no lack of egos. I didn't know what they did, but I thought I could work with this group of people. My sister, um, she's the smartest of the three of us. And, uh, you know, she was going to interview in New York. She came home and she said, God, I interviewed with Ralph Lauren, and their spaces were amazing. And I interviewed with Bristol Myers, but I liked the people better. I said, Carol, there's no contest. Go, go with the people. And she's had a very successful career. So anyhow, I sit down with, with Gus Guy Reynolds Haas, 
And he says, uh, he says, Ray, so I'm going to tell you, he says, three to five years, you can be doing a hundy here. I don't know what he was talking about. Now, my father probably never made more than $20,000 a year. You know, he was a bricklayer. You know, when they built our house, I mean, the family actually built the house. And so now I'm, I'm 27 years old. You know, uh, I've got a college education. I have a Corvette, dirt bike, a ski boat, and a house in Pensacola, Florida. I'm a happy man, right? And uh, so Reynolds says to me, he says, I'm telling you, you could do a hundy in this. I didn't know what he was talking about. So finally, after the third time, he said, Reynolds, when you say a hundy, what exactly are you talking about? He said, 100,000. I said, 100,000 what? He said, dollars. And I was like, what? My first reaction, what the hell would I do with another $70,000 a year? I was a happy guy, you know. <laughs> but the point was is that by getting out of what I love, because it wasn't, it wasn't marrying up what I saw long term, gave me the time to step away, gave me the time to experience something else I probably wouldn't have had, and I ran into a guy who opened up a whole new venue for me, and I ended up going to work with CB. So the thing is, you know, be honest with yourself. Revert to that vision. And I, again, I, I say it again, revert to what you think that you're trying to go at. That's, if you keep moving that way, you're gonna, you'll finally get there, or you'll challenge your way to go somewhere else. So you revert to your vision and your mentors. The second thing is, don't let change be an excuse. I've seen an awful lot of people who come into the business, the first year, first two years, you're learning, you're excited about it, you're you know, developing a new thing, then it gets hard. You know, I always said if I could keep somebody for three years, I probably got somebody you know, for, for a good part of their career. But people will come in and say, oh, you know, I have this excuse, my girlfriend left me, my boyfriend left me, or you know, I've been off this opportunity of a lifetime, I've heard that a million times. But really, well, all it is, it's an opportunity, it's an excuse to get out of working hard, to go out and try something that maybe is going to be, they think is going to be a little bit easier. So don't let change be an excuse. So now, you know, I decide to get out, and, uh, you know, I have this opportunity presented to me, and, and, and I and use this in a general term, pursuit of an opportunity. Who you know can be critical. What I hear all the time, and I heard from my own kids, Dad, 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 I want to do this myself. That's a noble comment. But I'm going to tell you, in the reality, how the world really works, who you know is, is invaluable. And again, I'll go back to this program. Your ability to network within this organization as a class, with people that have gone before you, you know, with people that come after you, and with the, with the, uh, the board, is absolutely invaluable. Of the last probably half dozen people I've hired, you know, I had more resumes than I could possibly look at. But what happens is I get a phone call. Ooh, hey, Ray, this is Jim Burke. I got a guy here great guy. We can't carry him anymore. Do you have an opportunity for him? One, I respect Jim. Two, I do the interview you know, with the guy. And, and in this case, Mark Scaife, we, we hired him. So who you know is invaluable. Don't discount that. The fact that you want to do it yourself is fine. All, I, all a contact do is get you in the door. After that, it's up to you. Second thing is prepare, but expect the unexpected. When I interviewed with CB in Seattle 27 years ago, whatever it was, uh, when I walked in, everybody wanted to talk about airplanes. Oh, tell me what it's like to fly off an aircraft carrier. You know, okay, 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 you know. And that was, that was a good entree, and I think Cal was fine the same thing. Maybe some of you in, basic, in your background. So I walk in now to talk to the big guy, this older gentleman that CB had bought their enterprise in, in Seattle. So I walk in, I figure he's going to want the same thing, you know, tell me about whatever. He looks at my resume, and he turns sideways. He looked out the window. He said, what's the hardest thing you've ever done in your life? I wasn't ready for that. I wasn't ready for somebody who wasn't looking at me. I wasn't ready for that kind of question because it was so different from anything else. But what he was doing was saying, hey, I want you to dig in here. I want to find out what makes you tick. What's the hardest thing you've ever done in your life? You know, and explain that to me without, without looking at me, you know. And so I've used that many times, you know, in the past. So you can prepare in a lot of different ways, but sometimes prepare for the unexpected. In an interview, in an interview, and you've, a lot of you have been in work before, you've had a thousand interviews, whatever. I, interviews go both ways. I always felt that, and I always told my kids or told anybody, interviews go, go both ways. You're interviewing me as well as I'm interviewing you. And when you, and when you can get to a point of dialogue in an interview, I always think those are the most effective. It's not a matter of having all the answers, you know, all the time. It's a matter of, of having a conversation where I can, you can learn more about us and I can learn more about you. Next thing is, is don't fake it. The best way to connect uh, can be, you know, a discussion. And, uh, and, and that, 
goes in a lot of different ways, and it's very, very effective. So be yourself. You know, don't try to be, because if you, if you fake it in there, then you're on the road to faking it, you know, on, on the whole career. Be yourself. Be comfortable with who you are. Second thing is every employer today that I know of is looking for a we, not I. You know, this is a world of collaboration, social media, of working as teams. You know, uh, the I thing is, is gone. So I'm sure you probably understand that. I had a chance, my, uh, my oldest daughter, who's a Gator, um, graduated, and she worked for a summer for Southwest Airlines over in, uh, in Texas. And I had a chance to go over there and spend a little time. And I have to say, I sat in a meeting with, uh, with Herb Keller, who's the founder of Southwest. Fana fa fascinating brand as a company, fascinating commitment you know, as a company. And um, Herb said this in the meeting. He said, tribalism is a, the deadly opposite of teamwork and a stupid orgy of self. Pretty profound if you think about it. Tribalism whether it's you trying to be you know, an army of one or whether you know, you're a little group, not operating as a team is a stupid orgy of self because you know, it's not the way things happen. Um, this copy of the magazine I had in Southwest is missing two pages now. So, but this was from the current chairman, Gary Kelly, and he said, he said, admittedly, culture is hard to define. Your business plan is what you are your culture is who you are. And he said, I ask three things of our employees every day. Work hard, have fun, and take care of each other. Very simplistic. Southwest Airlines, one of the best brands, you know, most people-oriented companies in, in whatever. I'll put those back when I get back to the airplane. Okay. So now, I got out of the Navy. I found an opportunity. I get hired by CB, and I'm off on my next part of the career. What I found out, I was enamored with the people. I really didn't know what they did, uh, but now I go from a cockpit to a cubicle, and uh, I'm ready for this next part. What I found out is I didn't like sales. Um, I was taught that when you get off the elevator, you know, you have to get by the receptionist, and you have to get to the person, the decision maker in the corner. So it was all adversarial for me. I would go to work, and I hated it, you know, because to me, when the elevator door had opened, I had an upset stomach. I had to go do some song and dance to get by the receptionist to talk to somebody. And so finally the guy that was training me, Rich Willard, came by one day. He said, what's up? I said, Rich, I think I made a mistake. I don't think that this is my career. I just don't like this, what we do. He said, okay. Somebody's been down a little far. He said, here's what I want you to do. Take a bunch of business cards. I want you to take these flyers on a building that we had. It was my first listing, the Wall and Redicott building on 405 in Seattle, Bellevue, Washington and just go to all the buildings around here and just deliver it to all the tenants in the building. I said, that's it, that's it. All right, so now, what was the difference in that? When the door opened, I wasn't asking for anything. I was giving something, you know? It was, that was the defining point in my career. I was not asking for anything, I was not trying to talk anybody into anything, I was offering something. And so now I get off the elevator and I'd have these gab fests with the receptionist and we'd talk and everything and, we have a great, great time. I got to know a little bit about the company. You know, I was not threatening to her. And um, I, I called on this one company one day, and she goes, hang on. I have to get my boss. they got to get a load of you. All right. So this woman comes out. She goes, hi. She goes, my receptionist is telling you about it. She goes, do you know what office you're in? I go, I don't know, ABC company. She goes, you know who we are? Nope. She goes, we're the leasing office for this building that you're canvassing. <laughs> really? <laughs> I said, that's not great. But you know what? We, we, we had a conversation. We became friends. You know, she understood what I was doing, you know, and we ended up doing some deals together, and it worked. But what it did is, you know, what it gave me was a purpose that drove my commitment. Now I wanted to have great relationships. Now I wanted to talk to people. Now I wanted to have the best information. That was the key in my career. It was not, I was not asking for anything. I was simply a matter of how good is the information can I provide and how good are the relationships that I could have that I could share. So lessons learned there. Learn how people relate to one another. Learn how they make their decisions and what their desires and needs are. The other thing is, this good friend of mine is an attorney in Tampa, uh, Dave Shear. And I was talking to Dave. And I said, Dave, when you hire for your company, what are you looking for? He said, three things. One, somebody that can listen well. Two, somebody who has some empathy for who's across the table. And three, people that can communicate well. I don't care where you went to school. If you can't do those three things, you're of no value to our company. If you think about that. You know, people that can listen well. Most of the time, you know, you're listening, you're already formatting the, the answer already, but you haven't really heard the question. 
Secondly, you don't really understand what the desires or needs are of that person across the table. So how can you formulate the right kind of communication? So it's something that I've you know, referred to numerous times. So now I've developed an ideology, okay? Now I have, I'm comfortable with my shtick and how I'm gonna approach the business and off I go and I meet reality. A um, Couple of lessons there. I found that, that I, had a, I had a value and control my time. The only thing you have in your personal life and your business life is your time. And how you value that is extremely important. People will use you, you know, because uh, they can. And so what happens is, um, I, I was, I think one of the first deals I was doing in Seattle was like a 3,000 foot architectural firm. They were running me all over this, the city. Finally, Rich came and he says, what are you doing? He says, Rich, I'm gonna make this deal. He goes, no, you're not. He says, they don't know what they want. And because they don't know what they want, you can't solve the problem. So you're wasting a horrendous amount of time. You know, and you know, I don't come from the background where you say you can't do something, you're gonna make it happen, you know? But I had to learn that. The second thing is many clients, the clients don't know what they want or what they need. And that goes back to what, what David said, you know, do you understand what they're asking for? I had a guy come in when I started in uh, Tampa. Came in one day and said, Ray, this is one of the senior guys. He goes, I can't figure this client out. It was the BIC company, you make the pens. He goes, I do everything this guy asked me to do. I go, well, that's the problem, John. This guy is probably from a different department. They asked him to do the real estate side, and he's asking you to do things. And that's backwards. You have to be able to, Monday morning, call him and say, look, these are 10 things I came up with to solve your problem. And um, he may you know, put five aside, but he may keep five. But if he has to ask you the question, you know, he's doing your job for it. That's, that's the thing that's wrong. The last thing is, is you know, most of the time, clients will impose unrealistic sex expectations because they don't know what they want. You know, and so you're, you're drifting all over the place. And again, you're not getting to the end game. So a couple lessons learned there. Cut ties if the ethics and mutual respect don't exist. Um, we were working on a distressed sale in Tampa, and I knew we weren't gonna get paid you know, by the lending institution. So one of my brokers came in and said, I think I know a buyer that will pay us. I said, okay. So who is it he told me? And so we agreed on a fee, I don't know, 4% or something like that. We get two weeks to closing, and the buyer calls me up and says, Ray, we need to talk. I go, okay. He said, I'm a little comfortable with this purchase. I said, then don't, don't buy the building. He said, oh, no, no, we want the building. He said, I just think the numbers are really kind of tight. We need to make an adjustment, which means we want to cut your commission. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what, Jack. I said, um, why don't you give us the leasing and management for a year? Maybe we can offset that some way. He goes, oh, no, no. I told you that we do our own management and leasing. I said, well, you also told me you were going to pay us 4%. He called me everything in the book. He went up one side of me and down the other 12 times. I said, Jack, I'll see you at closing. So we went to closing and uh, got paid. A month later, we, we, owned, we, we list a building downtown, a mid-rise building downtown. He calls me and says, Ray, this is Jack. He says, you have South Trust building listed? I said, yeah. He goes, how come you didn't call me? I said, well, last time we spoke, I didn't think we were on the top of each other's Christmas card list. You know? And he said, well, that's just business. I said, not the way we do business. And you know, that's what it cost him. It cost him that opportunity because I wasn't gonna call him. I didn't want to do business with people like that. The second thing is learn to say no. Dave Kahn is one of the all-time great people that I've met. Dave is a retail specialist in Tampa. And we were having this discussion. Went to Hamilton College, all-American swimmer, beautiful house on the water, was number one in retail in the country a couple times. And we were talking to this, he goes, Ray, you just gotta learn to say no. He said, Dave, I just don't know, it's hard for me. So he reaches over, grabs a piece of paper, and he goes, here, put that over your desk. No, okay, that's Dave Kahn, 71205. I've had it with me since that date, you know, and you do, you have to learn how to say no in order to control your time, to keep moving towards that end point, and to make sure that you're satisfying the need of the client. Um, I read a few business books. I mean, I, I read, I'm a junkie with news, usually it's current news. And, Books are usually a little bit in the past, but uh, there's a, a guy on TV you may see, Neil Cavuto, my sister-in-law gave me this book. And he said, to me, greatness is defined not by how we handle all that goes well for us, but, uh, but no, we deal with what that does not. I think it's, it's pretty interesting. And what the book is about is not only his professional career, he's had some very serious illnesses and how he's dealt with that. And that led to stories of other people he's gone. It's a great book if you have time, which I know is very limited, but uh, you can just read excerpts out of that. But I, the best people I've met and the people I've been most impressed with in my life is not the ones who deal with the good times, it's how they deal with the things when things, you know, go to hell. 
and um, you know, it's, it's a good reference book. Okay. So now let's talk about clients a little bit. So now I'm, I'm in the business. Um, I've found a way to be comfortable with what I'm doing. I'm, I'm managing my time a little bit better. Beginning on a few years now, I've got probably 10 years under my belt. And what I really learned, again, is that it's not about you, it's about them. It's about the people that you're dealing with, how well you understand what their needs are. Understand what's going on, why it matters. Uh, I was doing some work with Ohio State Teachers Retirement System in Columbus. So I was up making a courtesy call on them, and I walked by an office, a guy named Phil Robley. Phil and I had done a few things together. And he was in there, he had a bunch of papers. I said, Phil, what are you doing? He said, um, I'm making a trip out west. I'm going to go to Seattle and look at apartments. I'm going to San Gabriel Valley, look at industrial, going to go to Phoenix, look at office. And I said, um, okay. I said, have you talked to anybody out there? He said, no, I'm just kind of putting all this stuff together. I'm going to order my trip. I said, well, let me do this. Let me go out and get some lunch. Let me come back, and I'll call my counterpart in those markets, and let's see if this all makes sense. So I go out and get some sandwiches, come back, and I call Jim Bowles in Seattle. And Jim says, you know, Ray, I think you really missed the apartment market. He said, it's been kind of picked over. He said, but the port is going crazy with international trade. I think I would look at industrial out here. Okay, and we did the same thing in San Gabriel and Phoenix. So we reordered his whole trip. About a month later, I get a call from Phil. And he says, Ray, I want to thank you. He said, he said man, he said, that was really a very, very productive visit that you made. And my trip was, was tremendously effective. I thought, Phil, I appreciate it. I'm glad it worked out. Glad to help. He said, but I want to thank you for something else. He said, you gave me an extra week with my family. Now, I was still single at the time. I wasn't ready for this discussion. He said, you know, if I had gone out on that original trip, I would have found out that I made a mistake and I was going to have to redo it all again. So what, what happened? You know, I solved his business thing, but I gave him something probably more valuable, and that was the ability to have an extra week with his family. So you make them better. Uh, you become a valued partner uh, with good people and good firms. And so the lesson there is you'll be judged by the company you keep and your actions. I didn't have to go get sandwiches. I didn't have to do that. It was just the fact that I was service-minded and not, how can I help you with what you're doing? And it had consequences beyond that. The second thing is confidence in you will support connectivity. We were talking about this a little bit outside. Your ability to connect, whether it's social media, whether it's you know, classmates, whether it's the board members, is invaluable. Um, now, I'm sure that if, if the asset manager next to Phil said, I got a problem, you know, and Phil would say, hey, look, why don't you give Ray Sandelli a call? Here's what he helped me with. It was great. It saved me a trip, all that kind of stuff. But he's not going to do that unless he's confident in who I am and how I'm going to conduct myself and how I'm going to you know, do that. Because he's now he's putting himself on the line by doing that. So understand that how you conduct yourself and how the work that you perform is really your key to connectivity to other opportunities. Uh, what clients employers see in the best of us? Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of people in the business out there and, and all different stratas of capabilities and everything else. I'm going to tell you that spirit and enthusiasm, while it might be seem trite, is uh, at the top of my list. You know, how you approach every day, personally and professionally. You know, I mean, there was a commercial, I think, with Emmett Smith one time, you know, and he said, you know, he just did a bunch of reps. And he said, some people have to take a rest. He put the bar down. He said, okay, that's good enough. You know, I want to drop in bed at night, and I, want to, I don't want to have anything left. I want to be, I want to max everything I can that day. Spirit and attitude. You know, I think I was with the largest real estate company in the world. And so I think there was a lot of people that I worked with that felt that we were due, we were going to get invited to the dance just because of who we were. In, in most cases, that was true. Um, but how you take spirit, enthusiasm, attitude, and preparation into the equation. We had the opportunity two years ago to present a DRA out of New York. These are tough New Yorkers. And they're going to come down. They've got nine buildings. They're going to interview us for leasing. And we're going to present to Amanda Boach, Valla Brown, and six or seven other people from there. So now I have to create the team. How do I create a team that has no conflicts? How do I cover the markets? Who's the best people and everything? So we put it together. But before we went to the meeting, we went by. It was myself, the head of asset services, project management, the leasing team, the management team, the property manager. We walked through every space in every building. It took us two and a half days. And we looked at the space for what it was today, what it potentially could be tomorrow, where it fit in the marketplace. We went into that presentation, and we were locked and loaded. I mean, we were ready to go. And we sat there, and they drilled us hard. Um, at the end, Valla Brown, who's really the, the decision maker, 
We're getting ready to walk out, and we were fourth out of the five teams. She said, Ray, come here for a second. She said, could you take your team and just you know, wait somewhere for about an hour? Because they had another, had another. I said, sure. I thought, well, God, did we say something wrong? Did we not cover something? She wants clarification. So we went to the next building down, had a drink or something. We came back and walked in, and Valis says, you got the business. Now, this is business we thought was going to be awarded in two weeks. Bang, right there. Why? Not, I can't tell you we were the smartest team, but we went after that with a vengeance. We wanted it, and we thought through it a hundred different ways on how we can cover it. We knew more about their buildings when they walked in than they did, and it was evident. And it was evident that we had put the time and the work in up front, um, and so it worked out really well. So uh, the next thing is you know, commitment to the city of Morocco. When people come in, I think the salesman would drag me into a meeting, not because I was the smartest guy in the room, is that I was involved in the downtown partnership. I was involved in the Rotary Club. I was involved in a hundred other things. I knew the fabric of that community, and I could talk about the connectivity of their property to what was going on, what you saw in the market and what you didn't see in the marketplace. And people want that. They want to know below the statistics and the bars and the graphs and everything. And I think they see a standard you know, reputation of core values in the market, and that's important to them. I'm going to make a decision that I have to answer to my boss. I want to make sure I can trust you. So lesson learned, a desire to excel. And the other thing is be gracious in defeat and humble in victory. When you're working with the large institutional clients, sometimes it's not your turn. I can't tell you how many presentations we went in, we know we're not going to get this. Because we got the last two, and they're going to give this one to Cushman or Jones, Lang, LaSalle. When you don't get it, OK, you've got to come to the plate. You've got to play the game. But you know what happens? Uh, sometimes you're not the first up. The first person in stumbles, they're out. There's no, no hesitation, and you're in. Because you, know, you, were, you were gracious in the, de in the defeat. You know, be a turkey, you know, when you don't get the thing, you'll probably, they'll skip over two and maybe go to three. Um, just another quote. This was uh, by President Calvin Coolidge, and that's, no person was ever honored for what they received. Honor has been the reward for what they gave. And I just want you to think about that. I mean, I think in the early parts of your life, your career, it's all about how I can aggregate certain things. What can I collect? You know, what kind of watch do I have? What kind of car do I have? Where am I in the social circles and what type of thing? When you really think about it, the people that are really outstanding in your community are the ones that give. They give because that's where the, what you get back is tenfold of what you could possibly give. So that's a good quote. It's good, something to think about. OK. My lessons learned as we start winding this down is one, you need clarity of purpose. You need to be able to anticipate versus react. And, and some of the stuff you've heard, you know, I'm, I'm covering ground that's already familiar to you. But I'm telling you that it's the sense of purpose. If you wake up in the morning, I wake up early every morning. My wife goes, Why, what are you doing? Man, I can't wait to get started. I don't know what I'm going to do exactly, you know, sometimes, but I can't wait to get started. So clarity of purpose, I'm out doing something. Second thing is communicate all the time. Um, Steve Massey is an apartment salesman in our Nashville office. And this guy has lit it up for years. And I called his manager one day. I said, how does this guy do it? Because he's the most unassuming person you've ever met. He said he talks to people all day long. So I called Steve. I said, Steve, come on. You know, you know, managers don't know anything. Tell me what, what's really going on. He said, Ray, that's really the truth. I come in, and I talk to this owner, and I gather some information. I talk to the next guy, and we share information back and forth, and I, I just do this all day long. He's the control tower. He's who people go to because he's aggregating information, and he's providing communication. They know who he is, and they, he forms it out. He said, that's all there is to it, and he's made a lot of money. And he's very good at what he does. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, you can't passion. Passion can be fed by joy. I talked about that before. Impatience is a virtue most of the time. My wife says I'm too impatient about everything. But I'm going to tell you that I've, I've always had a sense of urgency in what I was doing. The thing that drove me nuts as a manager was that if somebody called me up and said, Ray, I need to talk to one of your industrial guys. And I looked, I, I knew book of business, and I go, call Rick. Hey, Rick. Nark, take care of this, you know, and get back to me. Next day, I'd see Nark. Hey, Nark, what the, you know, what the guy say? He goes, oh, I haven't called him yet. I wanted to throttle the guy, you know. I mean, I wanted to push it. Had, had fun with Nark one day. Uh, there was a, somebody called in. They said they had an industrial need. They wanted to buy an industrial need near an office near the airport. So I give it to Nark. He comes in. He goes, well, it's not our airport. It's the one up in Brooksville. I go, yeah. He goes, well, that's like an hour away. I go, okay, give me it. So the next morning, I think I haven't been in Brooksville in a while. So I drive up to Brooksville at O'Dark 30, watch the sun come up. I go by the building, take a few pictures. There's another building close by. I call that broker. You know, I get a comp. I'm back. I'm in the office by 8.30. 
Well, I had read in the paper the night before that somebody won the lottery up in Brooksville. So a day later, Nark comes in the office and he says, he says, you know, I was thinking about what you said. He said, I'll go up and do that. I said, Nark, it's already done. And I got some news for you. Today's my last day. He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, you didn't want to do it. So I went up there, went to Brooksville, took a picture, got stuff, information was out, and I stopped to get gas, and I bought a lottery ticket. Guess what? They're ace. He goes, no way. I said, you're right, no way. You know? <laughs> I said, but, you know, I wouldn't ask you to do anything I wouldn't do myself. So, um, impatience. I, you know, I, I continue to have a sense of urgency. Make people the primary focus, and re certainly remember it's not about you, it's about, about them. Taking you forward, I wanted to, I, this is my escape clause, because if everything I've said to you means nothing, I wanted to be able to share some other people you can blame this on. Um, so I called a few of my friends, and I said, here's what I'm going to be talking to these folks about. Give me some of the lessons learned. Jim Citrano. Jim is, uh, grew up in New Jersey, went to Colgate, played football, looks like Vince Lombardi. Got shot down a couple times in Vietnam in helicopters and stuff, and he said to me, he said, a lesson. He says, never assume you're the smartest guy in the room. I said, where'd that come from? He said, I got out of the Marine Corps, just like you, bought a couple suits. I was all spit and polished. I was pretty full of myself. I walk into the first presentation. I was pretty good with numbers. They said, Jim, you cover the financial part. I said, okay. He goes in, and he had plugged in a yearly rent as a monthly rent. Okay, the numbers were just all over the board. So his boss realized in the first four and a half minutes that they're way off base. So he's kicking Jimmy and finally he gets him to stop and they, he says, look, we're gonna have to come back. We obviously made a mistake. So they walk outside, Jimmy thinks he's gonna get fired. And uh, the boss says to him, Jimmy, never assume you're the smartest guy in the room. There's some geek in the back there who understands you know, the, this better than you do. And uh, you know, he's gonna understand before we all did that you're off base. So remember that. Second thing was a good friend of mine, Rod Crawford, ex Gator, he was with a cost of foods and um, Rod, they, the company got bought out by a private equity firm. He made a bunch of money. And in fact, I just talked to him this morning. And he said that he found that much, and he, after he, about four months later, he, he walked away, said, I'm done. Uh, not because of the money he had made, but because of the structural changes internally. And he said, I found it much more satisfaction in building something than maintaining something. Now, there's nothing wrong with maintaining something. If you get hired by Procter & Gamble to do something internally, okay, that's fine. But for him, and I think this goes back to what your end game is. Do you want to build something? Do you want to maintain something? And what is the, what is the job that's offered to you and does that fit for you? Ray Tordo uh, from Tordo Wheaton. Understand the drivers of your market. Um, we bought about 15, 18 years ago, we bought uh, Tordo Wheaton. They were out of Boston. They were doing econometric modeling. There wasn't a broker in my office who had any idea what econometric modeling was. All we knew was that they were taking our proprietary data, and they were downloading it, they were putting it, mixing it with economic information, and they were selling it, and we were pissed. Because, wait a minute, you can't do that, you know? So Ray Tordo sees me one day, he says, come here, I'm gonna explain this to you. You're all about this. You're all about vacancy rates, absorption rates, and replacement rates. What you have to understand is that that asset sits on this economic platform. And when you understand the connectivity and the pieces of that, the drivers of your market, then you understand what these assets are worth. It's worth one thing if it's in you know, Omaha, it's another thing if it's in Manhattan. And so, again, you know, understand the drivers of whatever you're doing, of wherever you are in, in the industry. It's not just about being an apartment specialist or being an appraiser or this, how do you connect it? And you connect that, we had this discussion outside, not only through data, um, because that's always published and it's in the past, but how do you talk to everybody every day and get current information that's, that's more timely? Skip Beebe. Um, I talked about two mentors earlier before. Skip Beebe was my mentor at CB. He challenged me like no one in my career. And we used to go at it and just beat each other's brains out. Because Skip was always flying around at 50,000 feet with these cockamamie ideas. And he'd call me up and I'd go, man, are you smoking something or what? You know, come on, Skip. And, uh, but then I would tell him, hey, look, here's how I think we can get that done. In fact, I asked him one time, I said, do you want me to leave the region? He goes, why? I said, because we're killing each other. I got calluses on my forehead from bumping heads with you. He said, that's the best of who we are. And I was like, what? So anyhow, I'm down in South Florida. I missed my airplane because I was running the state of Florida at the time. I opened Fast Company Magazine, and I find this ad. Half the ad is Carl Sagan, and half is Vince Lombardi. And under Sagan, it says the intellect to dream. And under Lombardi, it says the audacity to make it happen. And when I saw it, I understood what Skip was trying to tell me that the best teams 
are not the teams that are homogenous. The teams are when people bring different things to the table. Where it's tough to manage is right in here, you know, when you come together and having an appreciation for each other and what you bring to the table. But one and one should equal three, not one and a half. And, uh, and, and I carry it with me, I've used it many times. When Skip unfortunately passed away last year, but when he retired, I, I took his face and my face and put it together and it was uh, something that we, we both, both cherish. Okay, um, the last thing is, this is for me. Where do you want to wake up in the morning? People will come to me and say, Mr. Sandelli, I will do anything and I will go anywhere. Noble comment, okay? Let me tell you, when I started with Stevie, I started in Seattle. The first summer, it was 55 degrees and raining out in June. I went, this is not going to work because I could live in flip-flops, shorts, and a t-shirt. That was me. Some people like New England, some people like the mountains. You know, uh, I wanted to get back to Florida um, because that was the environment. Now, now I get up in the morning, you know, I walk 10 feet. I look out the thing there, there's a swimming pool, a couple palm trees. I'm a happy man, you know. So it goes back to what I said earlier. Think about, you know, place. Where do you want to wake up in the morning? Because when you, I knew I was not going to live in Seattle long term. I knew I was not, when I turned to the management side, I went to Cincinnati, it was too far from the water. I was not going to be happy there. And so I never connected with either of those cities. I had a lot of friends, good, good success there. But I knew long term it was not going to be where I wanted to wake up in the morning. I came to Florida and I was a happy guy. So think about where you want to wake up in the morning. I was, I got a call from our Baltimore office a few years ago. One of our brokers said, hey, Ray, could you call this woman? She's, uh, she's getting out of the Air Force. She's a pilot. And she's trying to figure out where she wants to go and what she wants to do. And I thought, well, she's in D.C. There's got to be a zillion people who made that transition. He said, well, she's a friend. So I called her up. Turns out she's working in the White House, you know. And um, that was pretty cool. So she, she tells me the story. I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a map, and I want you to put a dot on the map. All the things that are important in your life. Do you like the mountains? Do you like the beach? You know, do you have a family here? Do you, have, do you have a good time, friendly? Whatever it may be. Because that'll give you an idea of what's important in your life to date. And then start skewing it a little bit. You know, and that'll give you an idea of where potentially you may want to relocate to because it goes back to where do you want to wake up in the morning. And so she called me up three weeks later. She goes, Ray, that was the most amazing exercise I've ever been through. I think I know exactly where we're going. And now I'm going to start looking at the opportunity. So she started off with the place. She was relating to people. And she's, her pursuit was going to follow on to that. And I'll tell you the person that did that the best of anybody I've seen come out of this program, at least I'm aware of, and that was Cliff Taylor. Cliff Taylor came out of the program eight year, ten years ago. And um, Cliff calls me up and he says, hey, Ray, he says, uh, can I have breakfast with you tomorrow morning? I said, yeah. I said, well, I think they've got breakfast for all of us the next morning. So you're here for the, the, one of the conferences. He said, no, I'd like to do it just you and I, or I'll do it privately. I said, sure, I can do that. So once I committed, he said, oh, yeah, by the way, I invited Larry Ritchie from Cushman and Wakefield. Dog, you know, this guy has set up, you know, uh, a confrontation tomorrow morning. <laughs> so I'm ready, you know. Larry's a good friend of mine. I have well, respect him tremendously. But Larry and I will wrestle over a potato chip. So anyhow, we sit down at the table. Taylor sits here, and Larry and I are across from each other. We did everything but arm wrestle, you know, because we're trying to sell our things to, to Cliff. He ended up going to CB, by the way. Um, but what Cliff did, he, 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 he won. He found, he found the culture that he was comfortable with. He visited our offices to see the differences around the state. But he also included his wife's family who was in the Jacksonville area. And so he made that decision based on that. And Cliff has been tremendously successful. And if you have the opportunity to talk with him, he's, he's, just, he's done very, very well. He's a great guy. He came out of this program, and he did it right. I'll tell you, when, when you had the, the, the session you know, where you, you present to the board, you know, we would sit in the back there, and we'd keep score, you know, just some of us. You know, uh, how well prepared, how well dressed, how articulate, you know, how well thought out. You know. I mean, I can't tell you how many people came up. Hi, oh yeah. Um, yeah, I've been here four years. I'm gonna try to stretch out another year and if you need somebody, I'm your guy. Oh, that was convincing. You know, <laughs> uh, there was a woman, Rachel Ween, that went through the program, I don't know how many years ago. And we're sitting at the back, I'm sitting next to Craig Shear from Sembler. And she got finished and I said, I'm gonna hire her. He goes, no, you're not, I'm hiring her. And if you have a chance to meet Rachel Ween, if you haven't already, she is spectacular in every sense. Great, great person. Okay, pretty close to the close here. Core stuff. Uh, two more slides. Never, never compromise yourself. You know, you will be challenged in every way, you know, in business. Um, and when you, I'm, I'm going to tell you that people have the ability to rationalize almost anything, you know, and trying to have you accept it. 
sometimes the only thing you have left, and I've been beaten down a few times, the only thing you have left is your integrity. You know, and so, and once you compromise that, you know, it goes pretty fast. And can you ever get it back? I don't know. So never compromise. Second thing, make dignity and respect a part of everything you do. Uh, I mentioned a little while ago that I lost my mom earlier this year. Now, you know, neither of my parents went to college. Uh, we lived in a house that my dad built, no garage, a little simple three-bedroom house. Um, but as my sister said to eulogy, we were happy. You know, they gave us everything we needed. And then that last day, we were in the hospital, and my mother called me over, and everybody's out of the room, and she said, is everything taken care of? And I said, it is, Mom. You know, and it wasn't that everything was taken care of that day. She had prepared us for a lifetime, and the way she lived her life, you know, that we can move forward. You know, a very simple woman, you know, who had unquestionable love, who lived with dignity and grace every day. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a great lesson. Um, when I, I started talking about a year ago about retiring, uh, Rod Crawford, I mentioned earlier, said, you got to become your own CEO. And he said, you know what, in the office, you know, you had people to take care of different things, staff, IT people, and all that type of thing. He said, now, when you step away, you got to do the stuff yourself. And I was like, really? So I just get all my stuff and I go down to the Apple store. Here, I broke it. Fix it. <laughs> and um, so you have to take over those things. And so the last uh, eight or ten months have been pretty interesting. Jack Welsh made a comment one time, you're either the best at what you do or you don't do it for very long. And I want you to think about that. No matter what you choose, you know, don't kid yourself. You know, you got, you got to want to be the best at what you're doing. I don't care what it is. My son graduated a finance major, was on a dean's list every semester. Um, he's out in Colorado right now. He rode for the bike team up at Florida State, other school. And uh, did very well, and that's like the mecca for riding. And so uh, he said, Dad, he said, look, he said, I'd like to go out there. i got some friends out there that I raced against. That's kind of the mecca. And so that's what he's doing. He's out there riding. He's got a job as a bartender. He's uh, climbing mountains. I got a picture the other night with a light on on top of a mountain. Hey, Chris, what are you doing out there? He said, oh, it's really cool at night. Oh, really? I said, there's animals out there. He goes, he goes yeah, we carry bear spray. I go, really? Here's I got a news for you. If a bear comes up there, drink it. Kill yourself because it'd be less painful if the bear kills you. Than if the bear kills you. But you know, we're on vacation. And he, he was still wrestling with this. He was still wrestling with what his vision was. But you know, so we're at the beach house. We have a place in New Jersey. And I said, look, here's what I want you to do. You walk down the beach, and you find a young family with a guy who's got two, three kids, and you ask him if you had the chance to go out to Colorado for a while and climb mountains and go snowboarding and stuff, would you do it? I can save you the work. You know, walk because I can tell you what he's going to tell you. But again, um, you know, take some time. Think about what you want to do. You know, take some time for yourself. And the last thing is, you know, are you doing the best you can? Uh, when Chris finished school, we were out washing cars one night. And he came and he said, Dad, I've got a question for you. What's that? He said, how come you never asked me about my grades? He said, all you ever asked me was, are you doing the best you can? I said, that's right. He said, well, how did you know if I was doing the best I could? I said, Chris, I didn't ask you the question so that you could come up for an answer to give me. I'm asking you the question so you can look in the mirror and you can answer to yourself. Okay? So he walks out of the garage, he comes back, and a few minutes later he says, I think I get it. You know? And that's, that's really the thing is believe in yourself. You know, only you, I said, look, I work with some of the, a lot of people, you know, and stuff like this. They're trying to sell me on something every day. Can you answer to yourself? And if you can do that, you'll be satisfied. Final slide, I think. Um, one of the things I had on my bucket list you know, is I always wanted to meet Neil Armstrong, you know, and um, I had a chance with some people in Pensacola to go up to, to, uh, to Pensacola, I think it was middle of last year, and uh, we had a chance to meet with Neil, and we had a little private reception, and I was just amazed, you know, and uh, fulfilled that dream that I had of one of those bucket list things. And then, of course, Neil passed away not too long ago, but this was the, the piece that the family put in the paper. For those who ask what they can do to honor Neil, we have a simple request. Honor his example of service, accomplishment, and modesty. And I thought, what a great thing. Service not only to his country, service to his community. He was teaching at, I think, the University of Cincinnati right up until he passed away. Sense of accomplishment. He was an engineer, but he, he looked beyond you know, the lab to, to space. And a sense of modesty. You know, He was one of the nicest people I ever had the opportunity to meet. After we spoke, I went out to the, to the floor, and I wanted to get up close because I wanted to just, I was enthralled that we were in the same room together. So he walks down, and he's like from me to Dr. Archer there. And I'm like the only one sitting there because I want to be in the right seat. So he walks by, and I guess I caught his attention. He looks over at me, he gives me that grin. 
gives me the thumbs up. I get a thumbs up from Neil Armstrong. I was so taken, it was like, <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Armstrong, you know? But yeah, think about, think, think about if, if we could all be thought of that way, be, you know, that our example would be service, accomplishment, and modesty. If we can do that, um, I think we'll all live a better life, more enriched life, not only for ourselves, but for others. So that's my deal. I hope that I'll hang around and answer any questions you have. Again, this was not a technical presentation. It's just my journey, what I've learned. And uh, I think you'll find a whole board that would be willing to share certain examples for you. Um, it's about people. It's about caring for each other. It's about watching out for each other. And if we do that, we're better as a, as a world. We're better as a country. We're better as a community. We're better as an organization. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Thank you. Uh, I don't know what your schedules are, so if, you, if you're not hurting my feelings, if you have to leave, if anybody's got a question, whether you want to ask from the floor or you just want to hang around, I'm happy to do that as well. Huh? Oh, um, I retired from CB in February, and, um, you know, uh, I had some pretty candid conversations with my boss a couple years ago that, you know, I had the benefit, is this still on? I had the benefit of, um, of being with the company for 26 years, so I saw this growth from a company where you, know, you could actually lead an office. You could make decisions. You could hire. You could fire. You could develop your own strategy. And as we got larger, um, it was more push down. You know, it was a global company that you know, we would go to these conferences in Chicago and say, here's where we're going. Here's the mission. Go carry it out. Well, you know, I, I understood that, but you know, it wasn't as much fun. Um, I, rather, I think there's a difference between leadership and management. And uh, I, I knew that my, my run with the company was, was not going to go on for another five or ten years. And plus, you know, I was getting older. I mean, I, was, I ran the state uh, until I was, I said, when I'm 60, I'm off the airplane because I was gone every week, you know. And uh, so for the last, for, I just turned 64 this summer. So <clears throat> um, I, I was starting to stage myself out, and I talked to my boss. And I said, look, we were looking at an acquisition. I said, if we do this acquisition, um, probably one of these two guys are my replacement. And she said, okay. And then uh, she came up to see me in December, and she said, look, she said, um, we're moving the Tampa office this year, which we were in the process of doing. I'd like to get your replacement in sooner rather than later. I'd like to bring Patty Mooney up. I said, that's fine with me. So, um, I mean, she was making the change, you know. And, and, uh, but we had enough conversation to know, you know, kind of fit for both of us. So she said, what do you want to do? I said, you want to go back in production? You want to do business development? Or do you just want to retire? And I said, um, I don't know, I hadn't really thought about it too much. You know, it was a little bit earlier than I thought. She goes, well, let me come back. There's some formula. So she comes back the next day. She goes, well, look, if you decide to leave, here's what the package is. <laughs> That's easy. I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we, we chose a date, and Patty came up. We started to turn over and everything. And um, go back to what I said earlier. I remember that time when I got out of the Navy. I took a summer off. You know, I got out of the Navy in April of 1979. I sold my house, um, went, moved into an apartment. I had a 911. I put it in storage and bought a little MGB. And I went to the beach every day for like two months. I was this color, you know, <laughs> and I was having great. But it gave me a chance to think about what I was doing, and then I, I ran into this guy flying. Um, so when I when I decided to step away, um, I thought I'm going to do the same thing. You know, I I'm going to say I don't have to worry. I have, we can go for a pretty long time without worrying about finances. Um, so I thought, I'm just going to take some time off and decide what I want to do. And so um, uh, the, first, the first month was odd because you're, su you're in such a routine. The second month, you got to learn to say no because people are calling you. They heard that you left, and they want you to do different things. But what I didn't want to do was I didn't want to commit to something until I had a chance to just sit back and think about things. One of the first people that called me up uh, was uh, a company called CRE Consultants. And uh, about... 15 years ago, the company started going into third tier markets, second or third tier markets, and investing in an existing firm. So we, we expanded our platform. Well, now they're going the other way. They're shrinking that down. I think the reason they're doing it is for you know, risk management. They carry our name, but if somebody gets in trouble, they're going to go after the mothership. And as you know, this is a very litigious society. So they called me up and said, Ray, look, would you consider coming down here as a managing partner? Because we lost the flag last year, and we're concerned about kind of falling off the radar screen. And a lot of people know you because you ran the state of Florida and you know our competitors, you know CB. And I said, look, I'll, I'm flattered that you would ask. Um, 
but I'm not going to, I can't give you an answer until after the sermon. I was convinced I was not going to give anybody an answer until I had time to think about it. And so I had some different things. I, had, I got a call from, from the Naval Air Station in Pensacola. They built a flight academy, and they wanted to talk to me about going up there and helping to recruit corporate sponsors uh, to, to look at contributing to the, the thing because I knew corporate America, through, especially through Florida. Um, I had uh, companies like engineering firms and architectural firms that wanted me to do business development for them because I knew kind of that landscape. Um, but this is what I do. I mean, I run an office. And so it wasn't a matter of being comfortable. That's the only thing that I didn't like at CB at the end, and it's a great company, but make a mistake, is that I didn't like the layers above me that I had to answer to. And here, I was the managing partner, so I'm willing to live and die by my own sword. You know, I'll, I'll do that. And I knew these guys. We had done a lot of business over the last 15 years. And so and the other thing was our kids are all gone. And so for Jan and I now to, and we're going to keep our house, our other two houses. We, we rented a place uh, down at Basari Country Club down there. We thought, let's, let's try condo living see what condo living's like. It's just, you know, she and I and the dog right now. Let's try that, see if we like it. And if we like it, then we'll, maybe we'll move in a year or so. If we don't, we'll just come back, you know, because we, we own the homes. So I, I, we're looking forward to it. And so, you know, you, you ramp up, you know, and then you have this block, you know, where you're raising your family, and it's the greatest joy in my life. But now it's just, uh, you know, it's like the next point. And uh, so now we're, oh, we got to get, you know, get, buy another paddleboard, stand up paddleboard, and, you know, get out, find, find the best water down there. We need to go down the Keys again. We need to run across the alley to see our friends in, you know, over in uh, southeast Florida. So to us, it's an adventure. I can tell you as we start packing up a few things, and it's fully furnished, so we're just taking clothes and stuff. It's a little melancholy. Say, well, we're not living here like the day after the morning. Well, we are. We can come back anytime we want. But the other side of that is, I can tell you, once we pull out of the driveway and we're down here, we light it up. You know, it'll be fun. So... Full service commercial stuff. So we have an office in Naples, Fort Myers, and one in Stewart, Florida. And uh, I think it'll be fun. Anything else? Thanks you for your time. Good luck to you. You know, I, uh, if I could, uh, I think if I could do it again and, uh, you know, take off a few years and a few pounds, you know, and stuff like this, <laughs> I would trade places in a sense. So I, no regrets, but uh, only that, uh, you know, you've got a great future in front of you and you're very fortunate to be where you are and uh, for committing to, to do this. So that's it. Thank Thanks.